Marijuana is not a new drug. Its use was first recorded in the year 2700 BC. Marijuana is the Indian hemp plant, cannabis sativa. Delta-19 tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, is the principal psychoactive ingredient in marijuana. The parts with the highest THC content are the flowering tops of the female plant. Hashish is the dark brown resin that is collected from the tops of cannabis sativa. It is much stronger than crude marijuana since it contains more THC. The effect on the user is naturally more intense and the possibility of side effects is greater. The plant strain that grows wild in the United States is low in THC content compared to cultivated marijuana or the Mexican, Lebanese, Southeast Asian, or Indian varieties. Plant strain, climate, soil conditions, the time of harvesting, and other factors determine the potency. The National Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse report covers over 12,000 pages. This film concentrates on the most frequently asked questions by the public. First, the question is asked and the Commission findings are given. Then the findings are discussed by experts in the field of drug research. What kind of person smokes marijuana and why? The most notable statement that can be made about the vast majority of marijuana users is that they are essentially indistinguishable from non-users. And the reason that they smoke marijuana is that in the doses commonly used, marijuana is a mild sedative that produces a state of slight euphoria that many find pleasurable. In the mid-1960s, when marijuana first became wide, uh, widespread in the middle class, one could draw a fairly precise description of the typical marijuana user. However, since that time, as most people know, the use of marijuana has become very widespread among many different classes of people, and one can no longer precisely describe the personality characteristics of the typical user, his lifestyle, his values, his mores, his traditions, and so forth. So one might reasonably ask, why? Why this change? Why do people use marijuana? In my experience, I think the most common motivation would be that marijuana affords pleasure. It's fun to use. In addition, however, people will use marijuana at times to reduce anxiety, to relieve depression, to uh, reduce the boredom of their lives, to enhance the, the pleasure of routine, day-to-day, -day, uh, mundane activities. Uh, so the use of marijuana will differ from individual to individual and differ within a given individual over time. The specific motivations will, will vary somewhat but encompass a wide range. People smoke marijuana for a great variety of reasons. Uh, the chief reason, undoubtedly, is that they find it pleasurable to smoke marijuana. They like to be high, and they realize that smoking marijuana is a cheap and quite harmless way to do that. The commission report seems to imply that marijuana smoking is a rebellious act carried on by youth who want to uh, thumb their nose at the establishment. But the truth is that marijuana is smoked by people of all ages and all political persuasions. Well, my observations over the past 20 years, uh, during the 50s, people uh, smoked marijuana in the ghettos uh, essentially because they were living under conditions of oppression. And they used marijuana to make them feel better and to escape in some way. Beginning in the 60s with the, the hippie phenomenon and a certain striving towards humanism, people were trying to liberate themselves from what they considered to be a plastic society, or uh, better said, uh, robot roles 
uh, in American society. And increasingly, it's not just hip young people who are using uh, marijuana. It's people in uh, a variety of other kinds of roles in the society, uh, lawyers, uh, doctors, uh, airline stewardesses, uh, who uh, feel uh, that they are rather uh, uh, overwhelmed by the conditions of the society. Well, in the black community, it's a little different. Uh, many of us take the position of being against all drugs, including uh, marijuana, even though uh, we uh, admit that uh, it is the least dangerous of all the drugs. It does not lead to heroin. It doesn't do any of the bad things that it's alleged to do. But um, the point is that the young black person today, particularly today, um, is facing such a struggle. He has so much to do that uh, we feel he, we can't afford the luxury of, uh, of being stoned. Uh, another thing is that the pressures on black kids are much greater, much greater. The, the world is much more hostile than is the case for the white middle class kid. And the, the effect or the impact of, uh, of the drug is likely to be a, a lot greater. But we would rather educate than legislate or try to legally control the situation. Putting people in jail is a bad thing, and it really works bad against us. Uh, I've seen many men, black men, who have spent 5, 10, 15 years in jail for marijuana convictions, marijuana alone, and that's just, just a sin. Is marijuana addictive? In a word, cannabis does not lead to physical dependence. Well, the conclusion of the commission that marijuana is not addictive uh, is probably a reflection of uh, long-term clinical experience with the drug. It's been used for 3,000 years, and uh, so far as I know, there's uh, no documented instance of true addiction to it. So what uh, the Marijuana Commission was really doing was uh, simply reconfirming uh, an observation that is a very long standing. Well, the, in terms of physical dependence, you have a clear-cut kind of picture. It's a classic set of symptoms. You take an animal or a human being who's used the drug, who uses a bit, uh, quite a bit of the drug over a prolonged period of time, and what you do then is you stop giving the drug and you look for a set of physical symptoms to come out. You look for convulsions, salivation, lacrimation, uncomfort, discomfort. And when those arise, then you say the drug has the potential for producing uh, physical dependence. Well, when you look at marijuana, both in animals and in man, and there have been a number of studies, you don't see this, this sequence of physical events. And uh, uh, since that's the defining factor, then the conclusion is inescapable that marijuana does not produce physical dependence. I suppose it uh, may very well be due to the fact that um, uh, humans, at least, do not develop tolerance to the effects of the drug. Tolerance means that uh, either the body uh, is able to dispose of the drug more rapidly with repeated exposures to it, or in other ways accommodates itself to the effects so that to get the same effects as one initially obtained from a dose of drug, one must increase dose. This is not the case in, with uh, marijuana use in man. The psychological dependence is a much more difficult thing to deal with. You don't have a, a quantifiable response like a convulsion. What you're dealing with is the attraction that a person has for a substance, his behavior relative to it so that uh, you can become, for example, dependent on a lot of things. You become dependent upon TV, uh, where you, you just feel better if you're watching TV. The question then becomes, how much of this becomes your style of life? How attractive is that? How compulsive is your behavior? One of the things you can say about most drugs, and in this case, marijuana would be included, is that the more frequently, the more often a person uses the drug, and the better the drug makes him feel, uh, the more likely he is to become uh, psychologically dependent on the drug. Well, of course, there are two kinds of dependency. and uh, The psychological dependency, um, which the Commission says is, is the case with marijuana, I think needs to be expanded upon. There are various levels of psychological dependency. Uh, there's a felt need, there is a, a just a routine habit kind of situation where you're, in, you're used to doing something, you sort of do it because it's, it's just so easy to do it. 
there's a way of getting into the habit of doing something which, because when you get anxious or get uncomfortable, you find that this is a way to relax you. Now, a lot of people can get into the psychological dependency simply in terms of being able to relax or counting on that to relax them. The other kind of psychological dependency, however, is this sort of intense craving, psychological uh, craving, which I don't think occurs in the case of marijuana. It can occur and does occur in heroin. Uh, even when you reduce the physical dependency, the person can sort of just be overwhelmed by a sense of having to have it. And I think a lot of people mistakenly assume that this kind of psychological dependency occurs in the case of marijuana. So they say, well, even though it's not addictive, it's a problem because it's so psychologically, uh, that makes you psychologically dependent. It doesn't seem to make you psychologically dependent in that craving sense. And I think we ought to make sure that uh, people understand that. Does marijuana lead to the use of heroin or other drugs? Marijuana use per se does not dictate whether other drugs will be used, nor does it determine the rate of progression if and when it occurs, or which drug might be used. The vast majority of people that use marijuana never go on to heroin. There is some relationship between marijuana and other illegal drugs in the drug culture, however. For example, society has made marijuana illegal, it has criminalized the marijuana user, and it's forced the drug into the criminal drug culture. Therefore, a young person particularly that goes into the drug culture seeking marijuana is exposed to a wide variety of peer group pressures in association with people dealing other drugs. If there is any epidemiological relationship between marijuana and drugs of higher abuse potential, such as heroin, it is one created by societies criminalizing the drug and forcing both the drug and the user into this criminal culture. How does marijuana use affect the body? No conclusive evidence exists of any physical damage, disturbances of bodily processes, or proven human fatalities attributable solely to even very high doses of marijuana? Well, I think the uh, experiments that have been done so far have been, uh, uh, that, is tr uh, that is true. There, there's been very little in the way of abnormal uh, findings from single doses of marijuana as given in experiments. Uh, this is perhaps due to the fact of, that we're fairly conservative in, in the doses that we uh, use, and uh, probably also to the fact that marijuana is indeed fairly safe. At low doses of marijuana, the effects are very modest. Uh, they're primarily subjective effects that only the user is aware of. Uh, there depends, uh, it depends on the setting, the people around him, what he expects to happen and such. At moderate doses of marijuana, the effects might be crudely compared to a few shots of alcohol. Uh, some mild disturbance of thinking, some mild impairment of decision making, some slowing of reaction time, some moderate impairment of driving skills that some people can overcome that other people can't overcome. At higher doses of marijuana, higher than most people are talking about in this country, the effects can be very profound. Uh, gross disorganization, psychotic behavior, panic, anxiety, serious disturbances in thinking, uh, gross inability to perform driving acts, uh, perform fine skills. Uh, this is related to dose. Well, you, you have a difficulty. If you look at countries like India and Greece, uh, where they've been using hashish and marijuana extensively for a long period of time. You hear a lot of detailed cases where there's been organ and tissue damage that, that people ascribe to marijuana. When you begin to look at the population, you see that there's a lot of other drugs that they use, like opium and, and strychnine and, and uh, ouzo, which is, which is alcohol. So it becomes difficult to d distinguish between what damage ouzo is doing, which is alcohol, and what damage the marijuana is doing. So you pretty much have to rely on very controlled experiments, and mostly in animals. And when you look at those kinds of studies where animals have received marijuana and hashish over a period of time, and at autopsy, you don't see any evidence for any tissue or, or organ damage. 
Thus far in the research of my, myself and my co-investigators, uh, we have come up with no evidence that marijuana leads to significant physical damage, at least at the level of experimental or, or intermittent use. It, it appears to be a remarkably safe drug. Does marijuana cause birth defects? At present, no reliable evidence exists indicating that marijuana causes genetic defects to man. There is no evidence that marijuana produces either chromosomal damage or birth defect. And in fact, there's no suspicion that marijuana produces birth defects. We have seen hundreds of women that have smoked marijuana both before and during pregnancy and their offspring have been perfectly normal. Now this does not suggest that a physician should encourage a woman that's pregnant to smoke marijuana. As a general public health policy, we try to dissuade women from using any drug, legally prescribed or socially prescribed drugs during the period of pregnancy, particularly during the first trimester. But in general, there is no evidence that marijuana produces uh, either birth defects, chromosomal damage, or any other serious threat to the public health. Does marijuana cause crime or aggressive behavior? The weight of the evidence is that marijuana does not cause violent or aggressive behavior. If anything, marijuana generally serves to inhibit the expression of such behavior. Uh, from a very thorough search of the literature, there is no evidence that there is a causal connection between marijuana and aggressive crimes such as rape and murder and armed robbery. If anything, marijuana intoxication produces a very relaxed, slightly euphoric state in which the individual is pacified and in which he is generally rather passive and drowsy. If anything, the intoxicated state from marijuana use would predispose an individual not to commit crimes of an aggressive nature. The uh, widely held notion in this country that marijuana smoking leads to crimes of violence can be traced back to the 1930s when the press was full of stories and anecdotes about individuals who smoked marijuana uh, or who had been known users of marijuana who subsequently committed violent kinds of crimes, murder, rape, burglary, and, and so on. Uh, and without, without benefit of scientific analysis, uh, we decided that there was a causal relationship between marijuana smoking and subsequent violent behavior. Uh, I think that over the years, we have gathered a good deal of scientific evidence to suggest that that relationship does not exist, that there are a number of other variables um, uh, which are much more important. Perhaps the best way, I think, to consider the uh, aggression in marijuana is uh, by comparison to alcohol. For alcohol, we have uh, a great deal of experience uh, in its effect on aggression, and as well as statistics in terms of homicides and uh, traffic <coughs> deaths uh, resulting from its use. And in this comparison, we can definitely say that uh, marijuana is less aggression producing than is alcohol, uh, considerably less. Uh, tends to produce a more passive reaction where alcohol is definitely aggression releasing. The commission report also challenged a fairly wide, widely held notion that um, marijuana smokers are forced to commit crimes in order to support their habit. They made it very clear that unlike heroin addicts who who are forced into criminal act, secondary criminal activities in order to feed a very expensive habit. Marijuana smokers generally don't have to raise a great deal of money and the drug is not addictive. Is our society threatened by marijuana use? When the issue of marijuana use is placed in this context of society's larger concerns, marijuana does not emerge as a major issue or threat to the social order. I don't think marijuana is a particular threat to society. Uh, I think that for adolescents, uh, for some adolescents who use the drug heavily, uh, it can uh, contribute 
to an escapist type behavior, uh, <clears throat> a refusal to uh, uh, deal with realities and uh, the normal uh, growth maturing processes. Uh, if the drug uh, continues on a widespread on a widespread basis in society, uh, I think we will have uh, among adults. Uh, a certain core of heavy users in the sense that we have uh, a, a group of alcoholics among alco alcohol users. Um, that we all know many, many people who have had no problems with alcohol. They get along all right. Maybe they ignore their wives a bit or yell at their children a bit because they're mildly intoxicated, but very few problems. My guess would be that marijuana would turn out to be the same way, that a vast majority of society uh, could get along reasonably well with it as a social drug, just as they get along reasonably well with alcohol as a social drug. One observation that I've made recently in Northern California is that when marijuana is used by people living in a commune, people living in close quarters, uh, communes, many communes will uh, continue to function reasonably well. However, then when our old friend alcohol is introduced and becomes the dominant drug in the commune, uh, there often will be a fracturing, a shattering. The people will no longer get along well with uh, one another and will often leave, uh, perhaps in response to the well-known effects of alcohol to facilitate, in some instances, uh, enhance uh, aggressive tendencies in, in people. The Commission recommends decriminalization. What is decriminalization? Possession of marijuana for personal use would no longer be an offense, but marijuana possessed in public would remain contraband, subject to summary seizure. Casual distribution of small amounts of marijuana for no money or insignificant sums of money not involving profit would no longer be an offense. Well, decriminalization is a word for what I call the vice model. What that means is that uh, the sale of a commodity is forbidden by law, but once it's sold, it, as it were, acquires a kind of immunity, and therefore the possessor of the material does not become a criminal. Now, at first it seems that that's kind of inconsistent, uh, but uh, consistency really has very little to do with it. Uh, it's a legal arrangement which is designed to cut down on the ambit of the criminal law, to cut down on the number of people who are made criminals by the law, but at the same time to exert as much power as the law can with limited resources. And it's a very common method of legal control. For instance, gambling is controlled this way. Uh, the person who takes bets, the bookie, is typically a criminal in most jurisdictions, but the person who places a bet, the user as it were, um, is not a criminal. Prostitution in many jurisdictions is the same. The prostitute is a criminal, but not the customer. And the reason is not that any one is more moral than the other, but it's because there are so many more customers than there are illegal purveyors that it just makes sense to cut down on the supply by going after the illegal purveyors only. Now, this is true, interestingly enough, even in the automobile industry, where you don't become a criminal if you buy an automobile uh, without seat belts. But you are a criminal if you sell an automobile that doesn't have seat belts. General Motors would be guilty of a crime if they manufactured and sold automobiles without seat belts because the theory is they're dangerous. But to make every purchaser of a car without seat belts, a criminal, would just be too much of a drain on the law's resources. And that essentially is the model proposed for marijuana. That because there are so enormously many users of the drug, it just doesn't make sense to spread your net that fine and that wide and turn about a third of the young people of America into criminals. But on the other hand, the commission still felt that the supply should be restricted at all costs insofar as it was possible, so anyone who sells it or grows it or imports it would still be a criminal. The 
commission's activities are, are an extraordinary venture. Uh, I don't think uh, there's been another case in history where uh, the talents and the research efforts have been brought to bear on a single drug question uh, to the extent that they've been brought to bear on, on marijuana uh, so that you have a, a, a comprehensive coordinated effort to look at the drug socially, uh, to look at the drug from the law enforcement aspect, from the psychological aspect, from the pharmacological and chemical aspect. Uh, and, it, and it's really an historic response of a country to a well-defined problem and an attempt to analyze the meanings of all of this kind of data to that problem and to the country.